It's for you. This is the uh, Thursday evening edition of the Sunday morning No Hour. Good to have you here this morning, this evening. I was telling Debbie that um, doing this on Thursday has really thrown me off. I keep thinking it's Friday or Saturday, you know, because that's how my rhythm has been for 500 years. But um, glad you're here. Let me make just a couple quick announcements. One is um, to remind you that uh, we're starting in-person worship services this Sunday. And then um, on the following Sunday, there will be a in-person church at home in the sanctuary. So you can sign up for RSVP for those. Um, even if you can't go this Sunday, but you intend on attending an in-person worship service here, go ahead and RSVP. They'll put you on a wait list. And um, they really want to know how many people are just generally interested in being in a face-to-face in-person worship service so they can plan whether they have one or two services in the days ahead. So, yes? In-person church at home in the sanctuary. Well, you know, we've been having church at home and we watch the video thing. They're going to do that in the sanctuary for as many, for up to 100 people. So it'll be a video presentation. Um, and if you recall, a week from Sunday is October 1st. And November 1st, that too. <laughs> Um, keep me honest, November 1st, and that's the Sunday before the election, and that service will be focused on prayer. And so you can either come to the sanctuary and do that in person, or you can go to church at home and do it that way. Does that help? Okay. Um, so they're not new inspirations from being a, uh, I had a poll last week, so I decided to, to watch the, uh, the uh, video of this. And you all have a lot of jokes that you can't get the punchline when you're, uh, when you're watching from there. So, and also, anyone who volunteers to, to read the Bible could be somebody that's part of the front uh, because you can't hear it. Because Actually, the closer you are to that mic, oh, to that mic okay. the better. However, um, we will tell the folks who are watching on videotape, we'll announce the passage. Lord willing, they have their Bible. And can read along. Um, but yeah, if you have a question or comment, um, speak as loudly as you can. Um, I did under you ran it through your television and uh, turned up the volume, and that worked pretty well. So if you've got an HDMI cord, yeah. go from your computer into your television, and then you can turn up the volume as high as you want. To the point of pain. To the point of pain. Okay. Um, I do ask you to check your name on the attendance sheet. Simply, that's a COVID restriction requirement um, so that we know who's here in the event that someone gets um, COVID, then we can let everybody know who was here um, just to be on the alert. And there are wipes on your table. If someone after the class would take a moment and just wipe down the table, that would be terrific. All right, so um, before we get started, at your tables, take just a moment and share in a sentence or two, what has been your experience with divine healing? What has been your experience with divine healing? Okay, I'll let you give that some thought. Say what? Now and then, here and there. Now and then, here and there. Yeah. I'll um, just, I'll throw out uh, my, one of my first, experiences with divine healing was unhealing. Um, when Debbie had a, a ruptured disc in her back, she was in extreme pain for some time. We didn't have insurance, and um, we were um, not too long out of seminary, and in my, my first job as a youth pastor, and I fasted, and I prayed, and one, one night I stayed up all night and prayed and sought the Lord on that, and, and um, she wasn't healed. And that created a real crisis of faith for me. And, um, but fortunately, a month later or something like that, we got insurance and we got it taken care of. So 
in a roundabout way, the Lord answered. I how about you? <laughs> so you suffered for a month. Um, why don't you take a moment, share um, hopefully a little more positive experience of divine healing. And uh, just take two sentences, three sentences, whatever, and, and I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, and then we'll get started. So, so my brother, he's Okay. Um, and so we didn't know what two days ago came in. We had football size. We now. Okay. But I'm going to say, you want me to drive you home? Oh, no, no, no. You're okay. I just realized that I just not what I want to do. We're you know that. It's a lot of it. 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 I came down. I came down. I came down. I so six months is like the 25th or 16th of January, March 4th, we had the date of my other brother's anniversary, and I remember the brother said, it's a sad day. He's in the ocean, he's in the ocean, he's in the six years so I had four toddlers at home to deal with but my husband and I got in the car took him to the pediatrician the pediatrician accused me of child neglect because nobody ever wakes up in the middle of the day with croup and sent us to Children's Hospital in Boston <clears throat> I prayed all the way to Boston I, I couldn't leave my other kids and I couldn't leave this baby in the hospital and my husband and I prayed all the way to Boston that that he would be healed and he wasn't breathing that hard by the time we got to Boston. When we got to Boston, there was a resident on duty in the ER, and he said, there's nothing wrong with this baby, you can take him home. But he called the pediatrician, and the pediatrician said, I don't want to talk to the resident, I want to talk to who's in charge. She would not accept the fact that there was nothing wrong with him because she had seen him. So as far as I'm concerned, God healed him on that 
drive to Boston. Mm -hmm. wow. Amen. Amen. Cold night. Larry has a funny story. Larry has a funny story. Yeah. Founder of the church, a real old guy by the name, and got cancer. And so the whole congregation uh, really poured a lot of energy in prayer. And four months later, we couldn't find any traces. So we just go, whoa, awesome. And so he goes home, and a week later, he trips and falls down the stairs and breaks his neck. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> Y'all hear that? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Founding pastor, 90 years old of the church, and, and the congregation yeah, was diagnosed with cancer. They prayed and for a month. Almost a month. Almost a month, and they found him cancer free. And then a week later, he fell down some stairs, broke his neck, and boom. Oh, Lord. So. <laughs> so, yes. God's. Is that God's, providence, huh? Is that God's you <laughs> You'll have to ask him. I don't know. Well, let's take a moment and pray. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. So, Father, this evening we are grateful for the chance to gather together and to reflect on the things that Jesus has done. <coughs> And to um, ask you to speak to us and, and teach us things that we need to know. We want to know Jesus better. We want to love and trust him more. And we want to follow him more closely. So please open up the ears of our hearts to hear what your spirit would say to us. And our eyes as well to see good things in the scriptures. Thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are talking today about um, encounters with Jesus, and particularly encounters in which Jesus heals people. And um, we're just um, scratching the surface, I suppose, in some respects, because there are quite a few episodes uh, um, in the Gospel of Luke that um, record Jesus healing people. We're just touching on a few. Um, but uh, Lord willing will come um, at the end of our time together with some <coughs> insights into what we learn about Jesus. Let me just say at the outset that I don't think Luke's intent is to give us in this gospel and the accounts of Jesus healing people a theology of healing. That's not his intent. What is his intent? Do you remember? In Luke chapter 1, the opening verses, what's the intent of his gospel? To record factual evidence that took place. It was important. Uh, you know, with our witnesses, uh, eyewitnesses, and those who are close to uh, Christ, and, uh, so that it would be an accurate record. Okay. Yeah, he's. Um, putting together an orderly account of um, the events of Jesus' life as he has um, become familiar with them, as he's talked with eyewitnesses and so forth. And he, his intent is to affirm that these things are true um, so that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So he's undergirding what... Um, uh, has been said and taught about Jesus, and his intent is to let people know that these things are true. And it's, in a sense, I, I shared with you the first week, that this is a salvation history. Luke is um, talking about things that God has done in history um, that concern our salvation. And so he's not concerned as much in giving us a theology of healing or healing ministry as much as he wants to tell us something significant about Jesus and what he accomplished. Is it also possible that he was wanting to demonstrate 
strongly to the apostles that they had the authority and the power to do the same things he was doing. Okay, Nita's um, asking if it's um, um, possible that in, um, you mean Luke is doing that? No. Oh, that Jesus is, a, Jesus is um, providing a foundation for the apostles to have confidence to go out and preach and heal and do those very same sort of things. Well, that's, there's certainly some truth to that because he, he calls them to himself. They follow him through his public ministry. They listen to the things he says. They watch what he does, and then he sends them out. Certainly that does that. I'm not sure that's Luke's intent, um, but nonetheless, there's the truth to that. Well, let's jump in to um, this first summary report about Jesus' healing power. Would someone read for us chapter 6, verses 17 through 19? Luke 6, 17 through 19. Debbie, would you read that? So he went, we've got your Bible open. Yeah. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Okay, so um, what was Jesus' reputation and what were people experiencing when they encountered him? This is a summary statement of and Jesus early public ministry. What was his reputation? Teacher and a healer. A teacher and a healer. Yeah. And how far and wide did his um, reputation go? All over, All over Judea. Judea. Yeah. And he had a reputation, they said, that he said that everybody got healed. Everybody got healed. Yeah, but his reputation extends beyond the borders of Judea and up into the region of Tyre and Sidon, it was a Gentile country, a Gentile region. So his, his, his influence, his reputation is spreading widely, and his reputation particularly for speaking and teaching um, with authority. By the way, authority um, in this context means out of original stuff. So Jesus was not getting information from other sources, he was speaking out of original stuff, out of his own knowledge of the Father being um, at his side, seeing him, knowing him, and um, speaking out of original stuff in that respect. And that was astonishing to people, so they were coming to hear him. It's interesting, isn't it, that in the heart of man, on some level, to some degree, there's a longing to hear from God. And so people came from everywhere to hear him and also to be healed. All right. So, um, let's see. All right, let's, um, I asked you the question, what do you imagine it was like? What do you picture this to be like? And, and um, Dwayne, you, you mentioned um, everyone was healed. What's that like? What do you suspect what in your mind's eye does that look like? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Amazing. Astonishing. I'm sorry? Astonishing. Astonishing. So convincing for doubters. Convincing for doubters. Okay. All right. I'm sorry? A spectacle. Why do you say a spectacle? Uh, it, you know, this would be a good deal going on. If you gather crowds easily, and people would be in awe, pushing forward, trying to get up to him, trying to see what was going on, trying to figure it out. Okay. Yeah, crowds pressing against him. And we, we read about that in, a little bit later in another incident, but also... Um, we saw before last week that he got into a boat to teach because the crowd was pressing to um, reach him, touch him. Yeah. 
think quite it would have been frightening to a, to a degree. Frightening? Yeah. Okay. Just, Why do you say that? Um, the fear of the Lord and the fear of just somebody that powerful in my midst would be frightening. Okay. Yeah. I would be in awe. Awe with trembling mm -hmm. to be in the presence right. of someone who's doing this, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, just for a moment, this is just a little snapshot, but, but what do you see of Jesus? What's he like? Well, he's accommodating to the crowd. Accommodating? So they've come to hear him and to be healed, and he does those things. Okay. Okay. He meets their needs. He meets their needs. Okay. Compassionate. Compassionate. Okay. He was revolutionary. Revolutionary? He stepped out of the norm of the teaching of the day. Okay. He was an unusual, extraordinary teacher. Okay. He's like the lion. He's like Aslan. He's dangerous, but he's good. Okay. He's not safe, but he's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A couple things stood out to me. Um, he is sufficient for every need that was presented to him. He did heal everyone who touched him. No one touched him who went away un untouched themselves. So whether he had a demon or any kind of disease, he was sufficient for that. But also, what's really interesting is he's indiscriminate. Do you notice that? Everyone who touched him. There weren't any qualifications. There was no um, pre-screening. He was indiscriminate in who he taught, indiscriminate in who he healed. So he is, um, he has a wellspring of compassion and mercy that doesn't run dry. I, you know, and I was imagining this, I had some people in mind. What would it look like to take my friend Bill to... Um, touch Jesus and see him suddenly able to walk or get out of his wheelchair and talk. Um, yeah. <clears throat> see him little tie his legs straight back. Um, all right. Um, chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Would someone read that portion of Scripture for us? Um, this is our first individual account of healing. Thank you, man. Luke 5, 12 to 16. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. Oh, that's not in the Bible. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Great. Thank you, Anne. All right. What do you know about leprosy? Anybody? Can you tell us? It's a skin disease. It's a skin disease. I'm sorry? Deformed of the face. Okay. It's disfiguring, deforming. Contagious. Con contagious. It was thought to be contagious. The word um, in the scriptures for leprosy can mean a bunch of different sorts of skin diseases. Um, yeah. 
but thought to be contagious and was contagious? What else do you know? It was thought to be incurable. So they meant Jesus, right? They don't have pain. They can't feel pain. Yes, they can't feel pain. Um, it's the nerve. Philip, I'm sorry? The nerve ends in the skin. Right. Philip Yancey and Paul, was it Paul Brand? Yeah, I read that book. Yeah. Yeah, Where's God When It Hurts? The problem with pain. Pardon? The problem with pain. That was C.S. Lewis. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, their, um, Paul Brandt's experience in a leper colony was that people did lose feeling until they get burned or yeah, cut themselves or whatever and get infected and so forth. But, yeah. Anything else? They were considered unclean. Okay, they were considered unclean. If you read through um, Leviticus chapter 13, a, a leper was a person who was um, a social outcast. Once it was declared by the priest that this person had leprosy, they had to leave their hair unkempt, they had to have something over their mouth, and wherever they went, instead of wearing a mask, they had to just cry out, unclean, unclean, right? And um, uh, really cut off from um, the worshiping community, cut off from social relationships. Um, so it was a very difficult, lonely life. Now, let's um, think about this. What do you, what do you see um, in Jesus in this episode. He didn't uh, want to be known for just his ability to heal. Okay, we get that at the end, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he goes out to, by himself to pray. Yeah, and That's he, the priority. He didn't want the man to tell people about just that. Okay, he didn't want, he didn't want that broadcast. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And so there's this um, desire not to be seen just as a miracle worker. Nevertheless, people come to him from everywhere. Right? And he did tell the man what he needed to do. Okay, he, he tells God. the man what he needs to do. What does he need to do? Give a sacrifice. Okay, he needs to go to the priest mm -hmm. and offer the sacrifice required by the law of Moses. That's in Leviticus 14. Well, and according to the law, if Jesus touched the leper, then he would have been unclean as well. Okay. So, Anita, what does that tell you about Jesus, that he touched him? He wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid. He was compassionate. He was compassionate. He knew his power. Okay. He knew his power. I think because he told... Uh, told the man to go, you know, to the priest and this, do the sacrificial requirements, that he was not just concerned about him being physically healed, but he wanted him socially healed as well, and to, so that he could be, he could reunite and, and come into the temple again and be with his family. Yes. Make sure that that was known, that he was no longer unclean. Okay, so Jesus is interested in also restoring him socially mm -hmm. to the community because the priest would declare him clean so he could reintegrate into the life of the community. Good point. So there's a holistic concern, right? What else? One of the interesting things here is this leper is saying, if it is your will, you have the ability to heal me. Okay. So he's demonstrating his, his faith in what Christ can do, but he's saying if it's your will. Okay. All right. So the leper comes and says, if you're willing, yes. you can do that. But he knows that he can. So he has faith that he can, but he's not sure he's willing. So what does Jesus do? He shows him that he's willing. He has both... Um, 
the heart and the power, the willingness and the power to make this man well. So he, Jesus is um, more than willing and eager to make people whole. Anything else you see here? Does going to the priest and declaring what has happened, uh, is that in a way a testimony to the priest also? Why do you say that? He's asking whether or not Jesus sending the man to the priest is a testimony to the priest. Why do you say well, that? He had, he had so much opposition from the religious community and religious leaders. So it seems to me it would have been showing something to the priest in a convincing way. Okay. Um, it may have been uh, showing the priest that something miraculous happened through Jesus in a powerful, convincing way. And think about this. They declare the man clean. They've accepted his, off, his um, sacrifice for his offering. And so, um, uh, in, in a sense, if Jesus ever comes to trial, um, the proof lies on them because they recognize that Jesus did something here. Miraculous. So, yeah, it's a testimony to them, a proof to them. Sure. Okay. Well, anything else? It showed his divine power okay. because they thought that only God could cure it. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, it was seen as a, as a dreadful, deadly disease. And uh, he demonstrates divine power in making him instantly clean. All right. Well, there's something else here, too. Um, Jesus respects God's word. He respects the law of Moses, um, and he upholds it. And so he tells the man to go and offer the sacrifices which Moses commanded. So he's honoring the law of Moses. He's honoring God's word. All right. Yes, Leviticus chapter fourteen. Yeah. yeah, that's why I tried to clarify that a little earlier. I thought it was incurable. But there were times, there were occasions where and part of the, the deal was the priest needed to determine the nature of that leprosy, that skin disease, whether or not um, it was um, potentially incurable and infectious or if it was just a temporary sort of skin disease. He would have to make that determination. But if a person, um, yeah, was healed one way or the other, he could go to the priest and be declared clean. For observation. You see a little something more in verse 16, too. And what's that? He's going apart. His mm -hmm. humanity and needing rest. Uh, his need to communicate with the Father. Perhaps be refreshed and renewed with the Father. Okay. Jesus withdrew to lonely, desolate places to pray, to commune with his Father, be refreshed, um, renewed, sure. And my, I would suggest to you that that's a priority for him. And you'll see that in the Gospel of Luke as you read through it. Luke references Jesus praying more than the other gospel writers do. It, it's essential to him. So in that, um, I was, um, that I, that's where I was picking up too, that he didn't want to simply be a miracle worker. There's something bigger going on here too. Um, by the way, uh, uh, Jesus has this sort of two-pronged ministry of teaching and healing, and healing including casting out demons. But by far, 
from his vantage point, or at least from the gospel, what you see is that priority is on teaching. It's proclaiming the kingdom. All right. Let's go on to the third one. Um, would someone read for us Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26? On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> Okay, there doesn't seem to be any sort of chronological link here. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the um, um, literary link is. But um, Luke picks up this story about a paralyzed man, a story that we're all familiar with. Um, but um, as you look at that story, what stands out to you about Jesus? What do you learn about him here? Okay, he proves to the Pharisees that he's the Son of God, and how does he do that? And by forgiving the man's sins. Okay, first by forgiving his sins, and the Pharisees were saying nobody can do that but God. And then Jesus says, in order that you may know I have authority, tells the man to get up and take up his bed and go home. All right. Demonstrates the miracle. Demonstrates the miracle. What do you mean? By having him get up and walk. Uh, at that point, they maybe hadn't seen him walk. Maybe they weren't convinced that he was totally healed yet. Okay. All right. So his getting up and walking demonstrated that he was. Absolutely. Okay. And that reveals again something of the divine authority or power of Jesus. It doesn't ever say that Jesus touched the paralyzed man so that he could heal merely by speaking. Okay, just by a word. Yep. By the way, I need to back up for just a second. Rewind. <laughs> Did you notice that when Jesus encounters the leper, he doesn't cleanse him first and then touch him? He touches him first, then cleanses him. Why is that significant? Well, someone mentioned that um, in Jesus' day, if you touched a leper, you, were, you yourself could become unclean, and you would be ceremonially, cultically unclean. You could also get the disease. But it just struck me that Jesus does that with you and me. He touches us um, and then cleans us up. It's not that he expects you to be clean before he touches you. Does that make sense? It's the gospel. All right, so back to the paralytic. He, um, he doesn't touch him. He speaks to him. All right, what else? He actually said that he was the son of man. 
Okay. He claims to be the Son of Man. Paul, what's that title mean? Uh, pretty much that he is God. Okay, pretty much that he's God. Anybody know where that title comes from? Daniel. Daniel chapter 7? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere there. <laughs> Somewhere there. <laughs> And Daniel has a vision of one like a son of man. And he sees him approach the ancient of days. And the key thing is, is that he is given authority over all things. It's a great passage. It's Jesus' favorite title, by the way. He loves to call himself the son of man. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people's nations' languages should serve him. What a great picture. That's Jesus. That's the title he likes. It's the title he uses. So yeah, he claims to be the son of man. It's one who has pre-existed and yet he's been given all authority in heaven and earth. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would have been familiar with that title. Yeah, probably. We hope. Yeah, but it doesn't say anything about them. It only says they were, were all amazed. I don't think the Pharisees were amazed. I think they were probably mad. <laughs> well, they were there, though. But they were there. But it doesn't say anything about them. Yeah, whether or not they... Yeah, you know... Um, yeah, whether or not they shared in that amazement. Um, but it does say in verse 26, an amazement seized them all. Right. So everybody there, and there were Pharisees and scribes from every village in Judea and Galilee, right? That's a lot of people. It's no wonder the house is packed. Okay, what else do you see about Jesus here? One, one of the things is he recognizes the, the faith of the friends. He recognizes the faith of the friends? And, and, and honors that, their persistence and so forth. Okay, he sees it, and then he recognizes it, honors it. How does he honor it? Your sins are forgiven. Is that why they brought him to Jesus? No. That would be a little bit unsettling. I think he was rewarding him uh, for having such faith. So he healed him and then told him his sins were forgiven. Other way around. Okay. Both ways. He, he forgave him. And then when he perceives that the Pharisees and scribes are questioning in their hearts, about how a man can forgive sins, um, that's when he responds with, okay. let me just show you that I've got the authority to do that, and he heals him. So, all right. So the fact that he sees their faith, not simply the man on the pallet, but he sees the faith of the friends, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. What does that tell you about Jesus? Okay, it tells you that he's God. We'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. He goes, he goes deeper than his skin. Okay, what does that tell you? He sees the heart. There's something that takes precedence or priority over just physical healing. The most important thing to Jesus, the first thing he does is he forgives him. Debbie? So is he somewhat omniscient? In this bodily human form, because didn't he give it, give up his omniscience when he came to Earth? Or, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, he knows what they're thinking. He even knows what the Pharisees are thinking. And so he he's, he does have some omniscience. Yeah, just like he has omnipotence. Right. He gives up the free exercise of that, but by the Spirit, he does these things. Okay, so it's the Spirit that's giving him those. The and, um, yeah, it's the fullness of the Spirit upon him okay. that empowers him to both heal, to know, okay. to do. Well, the, 
the, the Holy Spirit came to give gifts to man to the church and that ability to discern spirits and to uh, uh, seems to be a part of that. So uh, Jesus would not have necessarily need to be operating in his uh, divine attributes. He could have been, uh, he was filled with the spirit, uh, so he could have been operating as uh, theoretically we can. Or the church can, more broadly. He gives uh, John, uh, the, the apostle John says, makes the statement that Jesus was given the Spirit without measure. Um, you and I are given the Spirit by measure. And Jesus has the fullness of the Holy Spirit. One of the things you'll see if you read through the Gospel of Luke, you'll find that um, the Spirit is mentioned several times in that sort of respect. He rejoices in the Spirit. And um, that the power of God was with him to heal kind of an unusual thing to say, but there's this power that's come upon him in the spirit that enables him to heal. Yeah? Well, like Isaiah says in 4325, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Okay. So, the fact that Jesus forgives sins is a fulfillment of that, or at least goes along with Isaiah 43, what, 25? 43, 25. Okay. Yeah. And what was the Daniel reference? Daniel 7, verse 13, following. Thank you. Question, Dan. Yeah. The end of verse 7, or 17, seems to indicate that the power to heal was not always present. Where, where, where did it say? Where does it say that uh, he was, Jesus was not able to heal because of their unbelief? Oh. Um, that's in Mark chapter 6. That's in, yes. It doesn't show up in Luke. Um, I don't know what to do with that. I, it, it might imply that. It might just be that they recognized it. It's a statement of truth. Yeah. Statement of recognition. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, I'm pressing you. What else do you see about Jesus here? Um, I think that that verse 16 is the key verse here. Verse 16 is the key yeah, verse? But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. And I always puzzle this about, or for a long time puzzled about this young man, your sins are forgiven, and why he said that. I think. He was in cahoots with the Father, and it was calculated. He's now going to really start revealing himself and not just throwing out tidbits. He's, he's going like, okay, we're going to kick it up a notch. Just, you know, I just think, because and all these other healings, he doesn't say your sins. Now, there may be others. I don't know, because I don't know my scripture. Well, but in these others in pre leading up to this, he doesn't say your sins are forgiven, and he could have. But I think he chose not to, and he chose very purposefully, purpose-driven, chose to, now is the time. We're going to, I don't know. Okay, that brings up a good point. Um, Anne is saying that verse 16 sets the stage for this because Jesus goes out, he withdraws to the lonely, desolate places, he prays, and then the next thing that happens is this announcement of forgiveness, which is new, right? Um, and I think there's some truth to that. In my thinking, what connects that previous episode of healing the leper and the healing of the paralytic is, is the notion of power, that he has the power to heal. And the next thing that happens is a situation where power is asked for and expected, but it's secondary. What's primary is forgiveness. And I think that becomes the shift. Kick it up a notch, maybe a good way to put it. These aren't, the difficult thing is this isn't chronological, it's more thematic. So, 
I'm s still pressing. What do you see in Jesus here? Well, I don't what think does forgiveness imply? Go ahead. No, it has nothing to do with forgiveness. Okay, well, let me back up a second then. Um, Jesus asks the Pharisees and the scribes, they're the border patrol of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. They define who's in and who's out. And so they're thinking in their minds, this is blasphemy. How can a guy, how can a man... Um, forgive sins. By the way, C.S. Lewis says that that's often um, the overlooked claim to deity as Paul brought up. Um, because it's one thing for me to forgive you if you sin against me. It's quite another thing for me to say, Lee, I forgive you for everything you've done to that butch. I can't do that. The only person that can do that is the one who's been sinned against. And the assumption is, all sin is against Jesus. So he can forgive it. Now, um, so Jesus says, which is easier, to say to the man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to him, um, rise, take up your bed, and go home? How would you answer that question? Which is easier? Take a nice breath to say your sins are forgiven. Less breath. <laughs> Words. Yeah, you can just say the words, your sins are forgiven. But, but you can't if you see say that. you're healed, you've got to see the proof that. Okay. So on one hand, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because no one can prove that. That's, you can't demonstrate that. It's a harder thing to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, because the guy's been paralyzed and, and uh, yeah, that, that takes a real demonstration of power. Okay. Let me suggest to you that the hardest thing is to say your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And why is that true? Because we have no authority or power to say it. We don't. We do it. But why would that be harder for Jesus to say? You have to have knowledge of the sins. You have to have knowledge of sins. Yeah, and he hadn't paid the sins yet. But that would be the harder thing. He would forgive him based on the cross. That is the hardest thing. So, I'm not sure that was the intent of asking those people that, because I think they would have gone with our reasoning. But when you get when you think about it, ultimately the hardest thing was to go to the cross for this man. Which is what he would do. Now, what do we call that? Atonement. Okay. Sacrifice. I'm sorry? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. What motivates atonement and sacrifice? Love. Love. Maybe a better term would be Grace. 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 Did this guy deserve to be forgiven? Does Jesus freely, unconditionally forgive him? He didn't even ask to be forgiven. He didn't even ask. But there's a connection here between faith in Jesus and being forgiven freely. That's grace. Jesus extends to this unsuspecting sinner unmerited grace and love. It's freely given. Does that make sense? Well, he didn't only give the paralytic since it's friends he said, your, your sins are free so Actually, he, he just says the man. Well, my, my book it says... Did I get that wrong? When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, oh, okay, friend. Friend. So he did say just one. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. We don't really know if the gentleman on the pallet had faith. What we do know is that those men who carried him up onto the roof, dug through the roof and dropped him down, Jesus said he saw, or Luke says he saw their faith, and seeing their faith, he says to this man, your sins are forgiven. So 
take heart. Your faith for someone else counts. Something really spooky. Yeah. You know, when, later on, when some Roman soldiers, oh, they bad, those guys. Okay. Roman soldiers are supposed to go and get Jesus, and they come back just wilted as babies, and they say, man, nobody. Sorry, I kind of get me a, a picture here. He, he was powerful. More than, than, than when it comes through, sometimes he, he's charging his He scared people to death. Okay, there is a sense in which he is, um, he unnerves people. Something uncanny, extraordinary, unusual about him. But he's good. But, but, you he's, don't want to but he's good. <laughs> he's yeah. outside the box. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have our boxes. In verse 26, it says, Luke says, and amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with God. It doesn't say everybody is <coughs> the Pharisees. It says oh, they all and they glorified God. Um, so it makes you wonder how they how those Pharisees were affected. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know exactly. Well, we do know as you go through the rest of the gospel, they become increasingly hostile. Yeah, because I was reading a little bit further, because we already went over it about the tax collectors, and they were complaining against him, and that was after this. So, yeah. There we go. Yep. Let's go to chapter 8 and let's read verses 42b through 48. We have these two stories of, of a, a, a woman who has a um, bleeding issue and then we have a little girl. And these two stories are woven together in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And um, but let's take a look first at this woman. And uh, so let's read verses 42b and through 48. Will someone read those verses for us? 42b means the second half of verse 42. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had had this child of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on position, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the form of his garment, and immediately the discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, he was the master of the crowd surrounding him and pressing in on him. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, to your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, what's this woman's life like? <laughs> Terrible, miserable. Why? Because she has COVID. No friends? <laughs> what, what was that? Her life is miserable because she has COVID. <laughs> she's, she's, she's worse than a leper. She's worse than a leper. She's equal. She's unclean. What was that, Charlie? She's considered, she's considered unclean. And can make others unclean. And can make others unclean, even if they touch just her bed or her clothing. And if you're unclean, that means you can't participate in um, uh, temple worship or things like that until evening, which is the next day. Right? Participate in any reindeer game. I'm sorry? You <laughs> can't participate in any reindeer game. <laughs> what are you saying? You can't participate in any reindeer game. <laughs> or anything else. Or 
meaning. So throw out some words. What's the no like? No boys could be with her because miserable, isolated, isolated, isolated. lonely, no. ostracized, poor. ostracized, poor, too. poor. Why do you say she's poor? She spent all her living on physicians. She spent all her money on doctors, and they didn't. And she didn't get well. She was probably anemic. Okay, anemic, weak, phys yeah. physically suffering. You bet. What else? Anything else? Okay, so there's this crowd pressing around Jesus because they're headed to Jairus' house, Jairus' house. And um, this woman comes up from behind because... She's unclean. She's unclean. Do you think she feels shame? Embarrassment? Mm -hmm. So she sneaks up behind him. And what do we assume that she knows? Then all you have to do is touch his garment. She could feel his power. She knows of his power. She's heard that whoever touched him was healed. Okay, Ed? Yeah, just what you said, what I said. Okay. <laughs> all right. That sounds good. So she has some faith that if she just touches the, the edge of his garment, that he, she'll be healed. So she comes up behind him, she touches him, what happens? She can she's feel it. She's healed. Immediately, she knows in herself that she's healed. She turns, she walks away, and what happens? He calls her out. He calls her out. Who touched me? Now, what's that tell you about Jesus? Okay, he's aware that something... Some power has gone out. What else does it tell you? Why does power go out from him when there's a crowd bumping him? Because her touch was different. What made her touch different? Her faith. Her faith. Her faith. And she didn't touch him. She only touched the hem of his garment. Yeah. Yeah. But it's faith that draws power from Jesus, right? She had a touch of faith. Everybody else could touch him, bump into him, whatever, and it had no impact on him. Think about that. In Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about people who have been in the presence of God's people and have experienced something of the Spirit and the kingdom, but they are not saved. It's a similar sort of thing. They never really touched Jesus. Never had faith in him. Jesus would say to the Pharisees, you guys study the scriptures, and they're all about me, but you refuse to come to me, even though you're around me and all that kind of stuff. And so that, there's a touch of faith. And the power went out from him, and she was healed. Now he calls her out. Why? Why does he call her out? To create a testimony to the crowd. A testimony of what? Healing, and power, and faith, faith. faith. Yeah. or just faith. <laughs> um, validating her and her faith. Validating her and her faith, yeah. the connection between faith and healing. I think you wanted to bless her. How did you want to bless her? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go without shame. Go without fear. He makes her whole. But he brings her out publicly because she has been hiding in the shadows of her own shame and her own disease. Here Jesus makes it public. You are now clean. You're whole. You can go have free um, intercourse with society. Fair enough? Well, and he wants to show her compassion as well because he calls her daughter he does this is the only place in the gospel of Luke he calls anyone daughter it's a term of endearment and affection he was this is not this is not me spirited this is grace and mercy it's not just about being made physically well it's about being made whole now there's one other thing go ahead Bill well, 
that's why she was afraid to come forward after she touched him, because she made him by touching Perhaps, him. perhaps that was her thinking. But she comes trembling, and she's on her knees, and she says, and Luke's, Luke makes this clear, in the presence of everyone, she tells her story. How humbling is that? And so Jesus says, not only are you physically well, he uses the term sozo in saying you're well. It can also mean you're saved. It's the same thing that we saw in the healing of the paralytic. You're forgiven. You're saved. You're made well. Go in peace. I would argue that not everybody who touched Jesus and was healed was saved. But those who had faith are healed and saved. And it seems pretty clear too, that when Jesus is playing with it, right? I mean, if I'm there in the crowd and Jesus turns to me and says, Who touched me? Like, I'm going to inform the creator of the universe what has happened. Who's going to look to me for information? Probably not. He, he knows who has. He's, he's making a statement. He's got an agenda for her. He does have an agenda for her. It's, he's not playing a game with her. This is part of her healing. Yeah. And I'm not sure she would have thought that way. Here's the creator. He knows everything. So why is he asking this question? She comes broken trembling, and leaves in peace. Anything else you see about Jesus? In the whole story, I see a parallel to our own salvation. I need to reach out to Christ in faith, and I need to be able to declare his name. Yep. Uh, yep. Good. It's a parallel with us in terms of um, uh, declaring the healing he's brought in our own souls, right? Yeah. That's what baptism does, right? That's the declaration. Uh, don't, don't go there. <laughs> you had to do it, did so. My wife's a Baptist. <laughs> and I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Presbyterian Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a contradiction. <laughs> Ruth Graham was a Baptist. No, she was a Presbyterian. She was Presbyterian. And he, he was, was a Baptist. Was a Baptist. <laughs> there you go. So By the way, I think I need to justify it in my statement. The reason I think not everyone who was healed by Jesus was saved by Jesus is you have later in the Gospel of Luke the story of the ten lepers. And the ten lepers cry out, you know, Jesus, son of David, or whatever, have mercy. And he says, go show yourselves to the priests. They turn around, they walk to the priests on the way. All ten of them are healed. <coughs> One goes back to Jesus um, and praises God and thanks Jesus. And Jesus says, the only one returned? And he's a Samaritan. And he says to him, go. Your faith has Sozo, your faith has made you well or saved. So I think there's a unique thing going on here. Anyway, okay, anything else we see about Jesus in this particular incident with this woman? He calls her daughter, so that's the only term that he uses on anybody. Yep. So it's like his own daughter. Yeah, very tender, endearing term. Uh, yep. Um, he's wisely compassionate. Sometimes, sometimes our healing will call for a very painful sort of breakthroughs, like calling her to tell her story in the presence of anyone or, or everyone there. That's part of his wise. He knows what's best for us. She would have just walked away. And then how does she prove that she's clean? So in, in his kind wisdom, he exposes her for her, her good and makes her whole. 
Beautiful story. You talked about uh, his sense of power going out from him to the heel. Uh huh. There must have been some sense of receiving that power too, to know that she was immediately healed. Oh, on her part? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 She must have felt something. All right, let's read um, chapter 8, verses 41 to 42, and then 49 to 56. Would someone do that for us? 41 and 42, and then skip down to 49 to 56. Volunteer? Chapter 8, verses 41 and 42, and then skip down to verse 49 through 56. I'll do 42. Okay. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But okay. as he... Oh, I'm sorry. That was okay. But as he went, the multitude was him. Okay. And while he was still speaking, he had this interaction with the woman with the um, issue of blood. Someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Okay. Well, let's, um, um, first of all, uh, I have a question on it. Okay. It said, Jesus said, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. It almost sounded conditional that he wasn't going to heal her unless they believed. And yet, he seemed intent on going there to heal her. Read that again. That's um, the first 50. The second part, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. Um, is that a condition? And so if, if the gentleman fell into fear, would she not be made well? Is that the question? Yes, it sounds like Jesus is, is saying, if you believe, then she will be well. Okay. Except that he doesn't say it here. <laughs> he just says, believe, she'll be okay. And he's, he's already sought out Jesus, so he's already got the belief. I'm sorry? He, Darius, Darius, he already sought out Jesus in the beginning, so he had the belief okay. that he could heal him. Yeah. He comes to Jesus, falls on his knees before Jesus, and, and, and pleads with him to come. His house, and Jesus says um, that he'll go with him. All right, keep that in mind. What else? Do you, what do you see about Jesus here in this story? He didn't have the whole crowd go in there, or he didn't have the, the girl brought out. He just took a, a few people to go to the healing. Okay, why? <laughs> in in Matthew, in the Matthew account, it says that there were flute players and there was much mourning and wailing, and so they had professional mourners come and wail and mourn and play the flute, I guess. And so it made me wonder how long that girl had been dead in order for them to round up the mourners. Good question. Yeah, we don't know how long this interaction, well, from the time Jairus left the home to get to where Jesus was, 
um, his interaction with him, then the interaction with the woman, and then getting back to the house. I don't know how long that was, but apparently long enough for the girl to die and people to recognize that and to begin to mourn. So, an interesting time. I don't... Okay, so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. Those are the three guys that will become the inner circle. And he takes mom and dad into the room. And um, anybody got an idea why he does this? I think he's training the disciples. So when he's in Walmart the fair, he's teaching them how to preach and how to heal and to go out and do the connection. Okay, he's training the disciples, in particular these three. That's certainly a piece of it, I think. How does this story end, by the way? Don't tell anyone. Why? What had happened. Don't tell anyone what had happened. Why? It's going to be obvious. Yeah. Because well, there'll be more people coming. Oh, God, raise my son, raise my father from the dead. Would it would escalate the crisis to right. lead to his crucifixion. It could escalate the crisis to lead led to his crucifixion. I think there's something a little more compassionate here going on. For the sake of the daughter. For the sake of the daughter. Can you imagine the spectacle she would be mm -hmm. if she came back from the dead? That's why Jesus says she's only sleeping. Now in the New Testament. For Christians, that's what death is. It's just sleeping. So he's not technically lying. But it creates a question in the minds of all those who are mourning. Well, maybe she's not dead because here she comes. So he protects her from becoming a village spectacle. Well, the Pharisees had a solution to that for Lazarus. They they decided that uh, because he was risen from the dead, that he was uh, uh, would be in trouble, so they decided to kill him. They were going to kill him. That's right. So I, I think what you see here is just amazing compassion. And he says to the little girl, it's time to get up. That's what a mother would say um, when it was time for their children to get up. Little one, daughter, it's time to get up. Rise. That word is also used of Jesus rising from the dead. It's a resurrection word. He did raise her from the dead. And he simply says, give her something to eat, and then don't tell anybody about this. Wonderful compassion and power. Now, so you're saying that he told he had the parents of okay the parents and the three disciples were in there and they're the only one knew that she was dead so but tell everybody she was just sleeping does that imply well, I think, that there I was not a miracle I think he was instruct I don't know that he instructed them to tell everybody she was just sleep sleeping I think he was just saying don't talk about it I've already told them that she was sleeping we bring her out into the daylight. And they'll see she was just sleeping. I think he doesn't want them to say she was dead. He brought her back from the dead. So she becomes this spectacle. village spectacle. Where everybody's looking at her, wow, she was, and treats her really weirdly. I wouldn't want to be the parent because everybody's going to say, well, what happened? They're somewhere going to say, well, she I was think just she could, they could honestly say what Jesus said. She was just sleeping. Okay, so then it was not a miracle. Well, not, it depends not on how you understand outside. sleeping. Lazarus was just sleeping. You, you, you made the statement that Christians call it sleeping. And, and you're talking to Jewish people now. <laughs> in, in the book, I mean. I don't mean me. Well, but I'm, and, that's, <laughs> and that's true. But even Lazarus was a Jew. And all the disciples were Jews. So for believers, death is just sleeping. So I don't think they're lying if they were said, yes, you're just sleeping. Anyway, okay. that's, the point is, he has remarkable compassion and power. 
Now, I don't think it's conditional. This is why. I think, um, well, think about this. Is there anything more painful than hearing that a son or a daughter or a grandchild has died? I mean, that, it doesn't get much more painful than that, does it? So this guy obviously is pleading with Jesus to make his daughter well. And um, Jesus, by agreeing to go, I think implicitly says, I'm going to make her well. He gets interrupted. The news comes that she's dead. Dad is probably devastated. And Jesus says, um, don't give up. Don't stop believing. She'll be okay. And I think the reason he says that is not conditional. He's already implicitly promised it by saying he's going to go. I think what you see here is faithfulness on Jesus' part. He's keeping his promise. And, he's, and, and there's a great application here, is that um, circumstances, no matter how gravely they change, don't change Jesus and his ability to deal with it. She was on the verge of death, now she's dead. That doesn't make any difference to Jesus. He can heal the one just as well as the other. But what he does do is he says, listen, in the midst of this crisis, rest in me. Trust me. That's a great comfort. Okay, the last one. One of the interesting things, he goes to the home of the ruler of the synagogue. Yeah. Contrast that with going to the home of the tax collector. Okay. Tax collector on I one hand, Jairus on the other. This must send some kind of message to the Pharisees to be sure they found out about it. You know, the ruler of the synagogue has invited Jesus into his own. Yeah. Good observation. That could be seismic. Yeah. Wonder what wonder if he still had a job. <laughs> The ruler of the synagogue was the guy who arranged the preacher, the reading of the scripture, the service, and all that kind of stuff. So he was a man of influence. All right, lastly, let's just touch on this one. Um, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17, is the, um, this is unique to Luke. It's not found in any of the other Gospels. 11 through 17. I'm sorry, 11 through 17. <laughs> Oh, I wrote that down wrong, didn't I? Didn't oh, okay. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Maine, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. All right, quickly, what do you see of Jesus here? What's unique about this story? Well, different. He did it in front of a large crowd this time. Okay, he did it publicly in front of a large crowd. Right. Okay. It was out of compassion for the widow and not so much for the son. Okay, compassion for the widow. Yeah, and compassion because of what? Well, without a son, she would be destitute. Okay. And no one to take care of her, and um, again, ostracized. And okay. Apparently, um, there's a large crowd with her. Apparently, that she had quite a bit of sympathy from the community, anyway. But she's a widow. She's unprotected, unprovided for, because her only provision, protection, was her son. And Jesus has compassion on her. Yeah. Uh, 
they, they didn't ask him to, to perform any miracle. Yeah. No one asked him to do anything. He freely goes up, stops the procession, and tells the boy to get up. What do we call that? Boundless mercy and grace, freely given. Well, and everyone another, trembled with fear. What? This is another case where he didn't actually touch the boy. He touched, isn't it a fear like a, a casket almost? Yeah, or a platform that you yeah. put a casket on or maybe or the body the on, whatever. Mm -hmm. When they're carrying it out. Yeah, he just touches that. And you get the sense he touched it just to get it to stop. And then he speaks. Who can do that? All right. Um, well, let's let's wrap it up here. Um, so, just um, as we've um, looked at these incidents, these accounts of these. Uh, encounters that Jesus has with people that bring about healing. What what do you come away with? What do you learn about Jesus? What stood out to you when you thought about these things? He's really cool. <laughs> He's really cool. He, he treasures people's faith, doesn't he? And he honors it. But sometimes he healed even when they weren't exhibiting faith. Yeah, we don't know anything about the woman or the widow in name, do we? No. Especially at the beginning, it said that he, he killed all. I can't imagine that all of them have faith. And we, I didn't know, I wasn't sure if you were going to touch on this, but we kind of discussed it here a little bit. And Yeah, what Nita's is talking about is um, that um, not everyone that we, we come across in these healing accounts have faith, but there is a portion of the church, a segment of the church, that would, would argue that if you are ill, handicapped, or anything like that, and you aren't healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. And it basically lays a huge burden and a guilt trip and, and shames people. Um, I remember my sister um, worked at Craig Hospital. Um, in, uh, she's a head trauma specialist, OT. And there were people that would come in and visit patients and say those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But um, she told me, um, told us once of an occasion when Johnny Erickson um, went into that hospital. And that's a whole different story um, because she brings the presence of God into a place. And you think um, that at the end of the day, in some respects, God is more glorified in a person who loves him who's not healed. Because by their love for him, they're demonstrating that he's more precious and more valuable than health and healing. If anybody would have been healed, Johnny Erickson Tyler would have been healed. And if you read through the New Testament, you'll discover that Trophimus and Tyler, or Trophimus and Timothy and Paul, Epaphroditus, they all suffered illness or sickness, even to the point of death. So that's why I don't think what Luke is concerned here with is a, is a theology of healing. 
He wants us to know something about Jesus. Well, every one of those things that he did could only have been done by God. Okay. It All couldn't, right. nobody, no one, uh, no other kind of person could do those things. Okay. That's one of the things that, I, the primary thing I think Luke wants to establish in this, is that um, all these things that you've heard about, I'm going to certify that they're true, which leads you to the conclusion that Jesus is God. What's interesting to me, when you read through the Gospel of Mark, Mark's a lot more fun to read than Luke, because Mark gives us a lot more um, detail. And there's a little more life to these stories. But that's not Luke's point. Luke's not trying to get us into the story as much as make a statement about who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He did all these things that only God can do. All right, so what else? What are some other things that stood out to you quickly? He's deeply compassionate. Someone mentioned that. He's, he's God. Just a question. Uh, in a ministry I in the past, there was a guy who, he was just the neatest fellow out there. Uh, he was a retired missionary. Um, he didn't talk about his, he spent 30 or 40 years in the mission field. But in private, once or twice, he mentioned that he really tried to be wrong for some of the Yeah, he was sharing the story of a missionary friend who longed for the days of being a mission field where he saw more miraculous things happening. I have a friend who pastors a church in the metro area who every year goes to Ethiopia. And the things that are happening in Ethiopia are just breathtaking. I mean, he has seen a person raised from the dead. He has seen all kinds of people healed. And the reports coming back from these church planting pastors that are just going out to the frontier and planting churches are just, you know. And then he comes back to the States and he goes, well, what on earth is going on here? Nothing. <laughs> well, the, uh, the people who believe that, that the healing is not for a day are called cessationists. And, and I heard mission leaders say that uh, my advice to cessationists is that do not travel. <laughs> Do not travel. Yeah. Because you're going to see things that will mess with you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah, that's great. In the, in the providence of God, he, I, I, you know, I don't know how to explain all that he does, why he does what he does, where he does. But anyway, we want to, our focus is on Jesus. Anything else? Well, it stood out to me that in each of these situations, that, and they were different, it required him to handle them in a certain way, and he knew how to do that. He had the wisdom and the insight um, of what was necessary for each of these healing incidents. Okay, he treats people individualistically. He knows them and loves them where they need to be loved, deals with them as they need to be dealt. Okay, I'm going to close with this. I asked you at the beginning of class how many of you are just to share some experience with divine healing. How many of you have been born again? You have been raised from the dead. You have been forgiven all of your sins. You have been promised a great future. It can't be taken away from you. You have been reconciled to your father. You've been adopted. You've been washed clean of your sin. You stand before a holy God, blameless. Holy and blameless. Now I think 
in the Gospels, and I think in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's fair that you look at these healing encounters, and I think we can find parallels. You were lepers. You were unclean. You had no access to the Father, and Jesus touches you, cleanses you with his blood, and brings you into the family. He's made you whole. You had, um, you're, you're paralyzed, you can't walk, you're blind, you can't see, and he touches you so that you can walk, and so you can hear, and you can see. He's done a great work in your life. In your mind. Lastly, I think that one of the things you see in the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is Jesus tells the disciples to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And there's a very real sense in what you see in Jesus' life and ministry is the very nature of the kingdom, particularly the kingdom that's to come, when there'll be no more sickness, no more disease, no more demons, no more death, no more dying. This is the kingdom, and you put your hope in that, and you orient your life towards that. So these people were bumping in, not only to the kingdom, but to the king. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Father, thanks for the scriptures. There's much that we can know about you and creation, and we rejoice in the beauty of what you've made. that we know you best in your Son, Jesus, who's the radiance of your glory, the exact representation of your being. And so we um, want to get to know Jesus better. And thank you for the scriptures, and thank you for our study in Luke, by which we um, get a, a better picture of him. So, Lord, um, we pray that you'd increase our love for him, our trust in him, our hope in him. Thank you for our fellowship. Thanks for being with us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.